Good morning. Beautiful music to start out the service. Hey, it's good to see all of you. Happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room. We'll do more with that throughout the service. Good to see you all. There's no one here. <laughs> Y'all need to spread out a little bit. Audrey's over here by herself, you know. Hey, welcome to Grace this morning. If you're sitting on the ends of the aisles, I want you to grab those friendship pads, open them up, see the various things that are in there, grab an I Give Online card. If you give online, grab a prayer card, fill it out, give us prayer requests. Right now, you can hand those to me or Danny after the service, or you can put them in the offering plates. Uh, if you don't have a name tag on, this is a great time to go ahead and get up right now and go back and get a name tag. We're answering today about a dad figure in your life. And so I just wrote my dad right here under my name. So feel free to do that this morning. Go ahead and turn around and wave at our online uh, participants this morning. So many of them that will be joining us today and then throughout the week. We are thankful for them as well. And then I have several announcements for us. I want you to just take a moment. I want you to look at the screens. Read through some of the announcements quickly. Like, don't dwell on them too long. But at the same time, I want you to look through and go, is there anything that I can participate in? Or is there something that I can invite someone to? And I'm going to bring you all the way down to the bottom one, 7-7, seven, seven, single service that day. Now, this one's pretty easy for most of you because you come at 1030 most of the time already. But that is like our post-Independence uh, Day weekend right there. And we're going to be celebrating that day. Bonnie, of course, will be right here in worship with us that day with the marimba and all those things. And then a potluck and games afterwards. So make sure that you have that on your calendar. Several missions things happening in the life of our church today. First off, you can see there are folks over here on these two tables because Love, Inc. does their impact program, and they have a whole group that is graduating from that program that helps, comes alongside of uh, women in their lives and tries to help them get back on their feet in a whole lot of different ways. And so they have been in that program. They're graduating. And so we have their names on cards over here. Anytime during the service, feel free to get up and go over there and start writing messages on them. There are some samples on there so that you have an idea of what to write. But think about like a yearbook, right? Like you're saying congratulations, way to go, you've got this. Like just little simple messages with your name under it. And if we can fill, out, fill up those cards today, that would be really fantastic. Another thing that we're doing is we are working with Heartbeat Denver uh, down in Central Presbyterian Church's basement. That's where uh, the men's shelter's at. We're collecting socks and underwear and various other things. When you go out today, there are two tables with socks with numbers on them. Okay, I want you to go up to the table. I want you to grab one that you feel like God is calling you to. Okay, now you've never probably thought God's calling me to a number, okay? But I guarantee you God's calling you to maybe get three pairs of socks or 12 pairs of socks or 50 pairs of socks. And for those of you who want to be guaranteed to go to heaven, 100 <laughs> pairs of socks. I know, I'm just kidding, everyone. We're Grace Presbyterian Church. We believe that God loves us no matter what, even if you don't buy 100 pairs of socks. But you will have a special place in my heart if you do so this morning. Friends, let's stand this morning. Let us sing our opening hymn. Let's enjoy some worship this morning.
And with that, you may be seated. Please give your attention to the screens for our confession and assurance this morning. Gracious creator, we confess that we have often failed to honor the diversity you have woven into creation. You've been fear we, not you, we have been fearful of differences and sought to tame and homogenize your wondrous world. Forgive us for privileging dominant voices and limiting perspectives, missing the richness of your creation. Help us to celebrate the diversity that reflects your divine image. God calls us to serve with renewed hearts and cleansed spirits. In God's grace, we are forgiven and sent to be the light in the world. In Christ, we are forgiven and called to serve. Thanks be to God. Amen. And before our grace blessing, I just want to invite you to close your eyes this morning. I want you to think about the many father figures in your life who have contributed good to you who have helped you become the person that you are, who sees you and goes, I love you no matter what, and who also looks into your life and goes, I see all that you can be. And with those eyes closed, I just want you to wrap that up in a warm smile this morning, opening your eyes now. And friends, I want you to know that just as you can think of those father figures in your life who have contributed all that good, there is a God above who sees that in you as well, who sees you and goes, I love you for exactly who you are, and also looks at you and goes, and I see all of the potential in you, no matter what your age is. And particularly for those of you who are older, you know how true this next statement is. It's not like you turned 80 and you like popped out of the oven and went, I'm done, right? God's not done with any of us. God goes, I have you on this earth for a reason. Let's contribute. Let's do some really good things in the world with who you are and the gifts that God has poured inside of you. And that is my hope for you, that you will allow that to come bursting forth today as you walk out into the world. With that, let us stand this morning. Let us do our grace blessing with one another, saying, grace in me and grace in you and grace in all of us. Friends, pass the peace of Jesus Christ and maybe a story about a dad figure in your life.
And you all may be seated. Before our scripture today, we're having a mission moment from Habitat for Humanity. Shana is with us. Shana works for Habitat. We're going to have Shana come on up here. Um, I want you to consider just how much one house, one home can change not just a person's life, but multiple generations of people's lives. As Shana comes, tells us who she is, what she's about, and introduces our guest today. Thank you so much. My name is Shana Weibel. I am the Faith Partnerships Manager at Habitat for Humanity Metro Denver. As you think about how much one home means, also just think about the cost of one home. I'm just going to drop that as a little nugget. It's about $500,000 to build one unit right now. And with that, that is all you're going to hear from me during service today. You are going to get to hear a story from Tirza, who is an incredible woman and mom, and I love getting to spend time with her, and you are going to love to hear her story. And then after service, I will be in the hall right there. I would love to answer any questions you have. My business card is out there. There's a bunch of flyers. There's plans for the site you're sponsoring. So listen to Tirza now. Come see me later, and please give her a hand as she makes her way up here. Thank you, guys. I am not a um, trained speaker, so please bear with me. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to everyone. Um, <clears throat> my story, um, I guess, starts a little bit back in, um, I'll go back to 2008. Um, I had just had my second child, and I don't know if you all remember 2008, but it was sort of hard for some people, losing jobs and um, kind of with the market and at the time, I was living in my own home, and I, um, I had two rental properties. <clears throat> but that year, as my kid was born, I had decided to become a stay-at-home mom so I could, you know, be with them, and, um, and it didn't work out great. <laughs> so we ended up losing um, the rental properties and our home, and um, my father allowed us to move into his home um, that he was renting out because he was working uh, in a different state at the time. <clears throat> um, in 2013, I was divorced, uh, and I became pretty much a single mom with my two kiddos and just on a part-time job because um, I didn't really have the help I needed to be able to take them to where they needed to go and pick them up, and so I, I didn't have the help to be able to work a full-time job or, um, or make up that money, so I just was continually finding myself in a, um, just in a, in a hard spot. Like, I couldn't get ahead, I wanted to get ahead, but I just, I couldn't see how. Um, <clears throat> my father retired shortly after that prior to, um, I don't know, maybe it was a few years, about three years after that, and he came to stay, well, in his home, and, um, and to help me with the kids so that I could get a full-time job, but he uh, took the unfinished basement to give us the space upstairs. It's just a, a small single-family home, one bathroom upstairs, and he was very um, sacrificing and, um, and gracious to us. So in 2017, I found a Habitat for Humanity. And uh, I'd been praying along with my kids to see what we could do. Even though my father told me we could live there and he could help, um, there's a certain amount of shame, I guess, that comes with the fact that you're, you're being a burden, you're an adult, and you should be able to take care of your children and help them also. And even though he's my father and he's trying to help me, it's just, it wasn't the best. He was retired. He's on a fixed income now. And um, I, I felt like I needed to be able to do something to, to help myself and propel us forward. So in 2017, I found Habitat for Humanity and I, um, I applied for the program. Um, the program is not just to people that uh, have very low incomes. You have to have a certain amount of income so you're able to pay your mortgage. Um, so we struggled with that because I didn't think I would, I would qualify um, because it has to be a certain range. Um, so we prayed about it with my kids and I was like, okay, God will open doors um, or he won't and maybe there's another path. But we were accepted into the program and then started a long year of um, two jobs <laughs> doing the construction hours. So I worked a day job at the city of Denver from 7 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., um, I got a second job because I needed to be out of debt by the time we moved in. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to afford myself and my kids. 
Um, and that was from 5.30 to 10 or 3 o'clock in the morning sometimes. Um, and then on Fridays, I worked at the construction site to do my hours. And on Sundays, I worked at the ReStore to get my hours done there. Um, a lot of the other families had, you know, husband and wife to get all those hours accomplished, but I, I, I could only do those. So it was just a long year. My father took on all the extra kid sitting. He watched my kids before I left in the morning, after he picked them up from school. I would sometimes have about 20 minutes each before a nap, and um, I would set a timer, and I remember it was, it was a really long year. Um, and then 2018 came, and we were able to move in. And meanwhile, my kids would come and visit the construction site, and the people were so nice at Habitat, they, they would take time to show them as the frame was going up. They said, your room's going to be up here, and you know, your room's going to be here, and your mom's doing great. And just encouraging, because it was, it was difficult um, to not be able to see them. <clears throat> Um, I still have the dedication paperwork um, that they did. It lists all the different, not all of them, but like the big sponsors, you know. There were many, many sponsors and people that would take volunteer days and come and different companies and different, you know, churches would bring lunches to people. It was it's just incredible to see how many hands it took to, to make one building go up. Um, so we moved in and then a year later I was able to stop my second job. Um, and I was able to be home, and then I was able to start studying. So for the last four years, I've been studying part-time, and this summer I'll finish my internship, and I'll graduate with my degree of uh, construction project management. I Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to mention that uh, on the construction site, I learned so many things, like how to use a hammer, and you could use it a hundred different ways, and... I was like, this house isn't going to stand. None of my nails went in right. And they're like, no, it's going to be okay. There's a lot of people that know what they're doing, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it was, it was a journey. It was an incredible journey. Um, and, uh, and because of that and the generosity of so many people with their, with their time and their money, um, we, uh, we have stability. My kids don't have to worry that we have to move. They don't, I'm not worried that I can't make the payment. Um, I've been able to now maybe save up some for their college so they can go to college. Um, they're 17 and 19 now. We've been there for six years. I was just able to put air conditioning in. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just little, it's baby steps, you know, it's very little. Like, you do little at a time, but it, it compounds, and it's changed my life, and it's changed my kid's life. Um, so I just wanted to say this last statement. Um, but the stability and opportunity for growth um, is immeasurable, really. It's changed my life. It's changed my kid's life. I know it's going to change their kid's life um, because I have the opportunity to do so much more than just work two jobs and come home and be tired and not see that there's other things that are possible. I just finished leading the VBS at my, at my church. I, um, I'm able to donate more time to other people now, and I'm able to give back in a different way. Whereas before, when you're just sort of stuck in the cycle of trying to just get by, it's very difficult to see that there's anything else um, that you can do. So thank you, guys. What an honor it is that we partner with Habitat for Humanity, that we get to hear stories like that, that you get to contribute to something like that. And before I forget, uh, August 17th, is a day that you actually can go out to one of the sites and you get to use a hammer in a hundred different ways. So if that's something that you want to do, that you want to volunteer your time, August 17th, mark your calendars, get your hard hat and your helmets, and go change the world. Let us turn to scripture this morning. Our passage comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Listen to God's word as it comes to us this morning. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, 
They are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And may the Holy Spirit grant us understanding as we seek to apply such a passage to our lives. What do we do with this passage? Seriously, how do we interpret? How do we read such a passage? How do we come to understand what this passage is attempting to assert? What's going on here? We've been in this Sacred Earth, Sacred Worth sermon series. And, you know, we started way back at the beginning with Genesis of creation, of God being a God of creativity and design, of all the cosmos, that everything was working in harmony that everything was together and in unity. And then we get to chapter 11 in Genesis, and it's all division. All of a sudden, God is confusing God's people. God is making people speak of different languages, that there's all of a sudden division happening. So then how do we come to such a text? How do we understand this division that has been from the very beginning of all of creation. Maybe, just maybe, there's something glorious to be told, something glorious to be found, something glorious to see in all the diversity that we come upon. You know, if I'm being completely honest, I wrestled with this text all week long preparing for this sermon. I think I wrote about three different sermons for this scripture passage. And I really didn't like two of them. I loved one of them. But every pastor knows the one that you love and the one you want to preach is never the one God tells you to preach. And you're like, oh, but it's so uplifting. It's so spiritual and encouraging. It's going to leave people feeling fueled and excited. And God says, nah, save that for a rainy day. And then my other two, you know, one was a little more theological of what this Tower of Babel story is. And then one of them, one of them was a challenge. One of them I wrote and I read through and I said, oh, I don't want to preach that sermon. It's a challenge. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. But guess what? That's the one that you get to hear today. So buckle up, we are going to be a little uncomfortable today. We're going to lean in, though, with curiosity, and we're going to lean in with love. Because I come to this passage about diversity, and I actually, I think of a unique event that happened this last week at Grace. How many of you were able to attend the one-year anniversary of Reverend Rafat's APIC? How many of you were, yes, so many of us were there. This room was packed full with so many different people, so many different people from different tribes, different nations, different languages. At one point in the evening, I sat down at a table, and I was the only English-speaking person at that table, and I was so uncomfortable. I had to sit in that discomfort, and then there was a moment that I felt quite a bit of shame if I'm being honest. Shame that I couldn't communicate to the people around that table. I felt shame that I thought English should be the only language that we were speaking at that event. And so I sat at that table and we looked around at one another, very uncomfortably smiled, made a little awkward laughter here and there. But as I continued to look around the table, from people of different backgrounds, of different cultures and ethnicities than mine, I said, man, God is right here. God is at this table with us and among us. This 
is what it looks like to sit amongst glorious diversity. Looking into the eyes of everyone at that table, we spoke different languages, but our, our true human language was the same. Because we all have this desire to belong. We all have this desire to feel like we are in the place we belong. We all have longings, have passions. We all have a lot of loss and devastation. And so sitting among that table was a humbling moment for me and an incredibly good sacred reminder of what God's glorious diversity looks like. Because we can look at diversity and we can say it's division, it's bad. It's not good. We all need to be the same. We all need to look and think and act the same. Or we can look at diversity and say, isn't this wonderful? Isn't it glorious that we are so different? Isn't it glorious that we can be here with one another and still be living and laughing and eating good food and praying in different languages and serving God in all of these wondrous capacities. So this passage, it's a tough one. How many of you read that and you were like, oh, that, that, that sounds nice. That's an easy passage to interpret. Anybody? Because if so, I have another microphone and I would love to hear your input. <laughs> this passage calls us to be uncomfortable. This passage calls us to sit with what it means to be different than one another. We can read the passage at face value and say, oh, this is how God divided languages. This is why we have so many different languages throughout the world. Or we could lean a step further and say, God is diversity. God didn't make division, but God is diversity. That every different language, every different skin color, every just different ethnicity, every different mind and soul is a representation, representation of who God is. You know, one of my most humbling and amazing experiences was uh, when I attended McCormick Theological Seminary. It's based out of Chicago, but uh, because of COVID, I attended online, as most of you know, and I can count on one hand how many white students were in each of my classes. And I can count on about one or two fingers how many white women were in these classes. And I remember that first year of studying, I was silent. I listened. I remember my husband would often be in the other room and he would listen to my class discussions. And I'd come out and he'd say, why aren't you talking? You have so much to contribute to those conversations, and you're not saying anything. And I was like, this dominant voice has been echoed for far too long in this country. There are other voices that need to be lifted around that table. I need to listen to the diversity around this screen. And in fact, I want to embody that diversity so that my ministry to which God has called me, can come to wholeness and fruition, that I can lean into what it means to pastor all people from all tribes, all languages, and all nations. I want to hear, I want to listen, and I want to observe. And I had the most amazing three years in such a diverse group of people. I made lifelong friendships that I'm so grateful for. People that I can text or call or FaceTime or Zoom at any time throughout the week that'll be there for me. And none of us look the same. And in fact, sometimes we have to use Google translation to adequately understand one another. And I loved that. I love having that community with me. One of my favorite stories, too, from uh, seminary was uh, obviously I attended online virtually. And uh, 
it was time for graduation, and I was flying into Chicago, and uh, I was supposed to be going and picking up my robe and my stoles for the ceremony the next morning, and I, I wasn't going to make it on time. And so I called my sweet friend Donna. I said, Donna, you have to go pick up my robe and stoles. I'm not going to be there on time. And she says, I got you. I got you. Don't you worry. And so she goes, and she's picking up all my stuff from the administrative team, and uh, they hand the robe and the stole over to her, and they handed her the stole, which apparently only African-American students received. And Donna starts laughing, and she says, do you know Danny? And they were all like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, we know her. We've emailed her and called her. We, we've known her for like three years now. She's attended here. And Donna says, well, Danny's white, so she doesn't get a stole. And they were like, oh. And they took the stole back. And then Donna said, well, wait a minute. For three years, you have taught us to be inclusive. For three years, you have told us that we are all equal, that we are all to represent God and God's image. And now at graduation, she's going to be the only woman, the only white woman at graduation, and she's going to be the only woman without a stole. And if you knew Donna... She said, mm, 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 she's going to wear a stole. And so sure enough, I show up to Donna's house, and she said, I got you a stole. And at first I was like, okay, but then she told me the story. And I love that because it's breaking down divisions. Because we read this passage We read that division is an overarching theme in many of the books of the Bible. But then we look how far we've gone as a human race to divide ourselves even more so. This upcoming week, we're celebrating a national holiday. It's fairly new to our country, but it's called Juneteenth. If you haven't heard about it, if you don't know about it, if you're one of those that are kind of like, I don't know, look it up. Know your country's history. Know that it's a celebration of liberation, of enslaved bodies, enslaved black bodies. We enslaved people based on their color. Human beings had the audacity to claim privilege, to claim rightness, to build a tower and call ourselves God and that we could own another human being. Juneteenth, this upcoming Wednesday, I hope you find a moment of reflection and pause. And not only reflection and pause, but celebration. Celebration that we are finally, finally making steps towards equality. True equality. That we finally are making steps of saying, no, no, no does not matter the color of our skin, does not matter what language you speak, you're my brother, you're my sister, you're a beloved image of God. So I touched on Juneteenth, that's a little tricky for some people, a little touchy. What else do we celebrate in June? Pride, another controversial topic. That most of you are like, oh, we're at church. We're supposed to be uplifted. We're supposed to feel good. That should still make us feel good. We're celebrating people. Because even within the English language, we have divisions. We have different tribes that we speak to in the English language. We speak the same political affiliation. We speak the same religious affiliation. We speak different types of languages where our backgrounds come from, where our gender, our sexuality is. And we've divided ourselves and divided ourselves and divided ourselves. We like to surround ourselves in echo chambers where we only speak with the ones that think the same as we do, that look the same as we do, that celebrate life the same as we do. But that's not what we're called to do. That's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to step into diversity because God is diversity. God calls us to be among people who are very different than us. 
I want you to take a moment, and I want you to look around this room. You might think to yourself, it's not a very diverse room, but without pointing fingers or saying names or anything, I want you to see if you can find someone who votes differently than you. <laughs> I said, don't say any names, no pointing. There is diversity, and that is beautiful. Diversity is a glorious and wonderful thing that should be celebrated. We don't use diversity against one another, but we use it to come together, to celebrate the richness of who God is. So we have this Tower of Babel story, the beginning of creation, predated Christ, But then we also have this really phenomenal story in the book of Acts, which is what we've been going through in this Pentecost sermon series. And it sounds like this. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? I believe Pentecost is the revert of the Tower of Babel. It's this division coming together in the Spirit, this unity even amongst divided languages, even amongst diversity. Because you and I, we're not so different. We might think differently, look differently, vote differently, act differently, live differently, celebrate differently. Oh, but we're one in the spirit. And this spirit among us is indeed diversity. Amen. Good morning and happy Father's Day. I was thrilled with Sunday night, if you were there. We got to hear a Vietnamese choir. We got to to hear an Hispanic choir. um, And our own choir performed beautifully. And it was just a wonderful celebration. And we're looking for that ministry to continue in the future. I'm going to borrow an exercise that we talked about way back on Mother's Day you know, a month ago or whenever, um, and start, finish what Justin was talking about, thinking about your dad or father figure in your life. For better or worse, that person helped make you who you are today and shaped you, hopefully for better. Uh, was he funny? Did he have those dad jokes? Vacations, think back to those vacations that you would take back when they would have one week if you were lucky. Um, What did he teach you? When you were a munchkin, did you go fishing? Um, I was taught actions speak louder than words. What kind of influence did he have on your life? Um, My dad died when I was... freshman in college, Um, but he was a lithographer. Do you know what that is? It's a printer, somebody that printed. He was quite the artist, never really fulfilled his dream of being an artist, but he went to work for other people being an artist, and that had an influence on me, and I love art. I love music. That half of my brain was very nourished, Um, but I also knew about his sacrifices at the time, Did your dad make sacrifices for you and the family? Mine had two jobs to keep things going so he could pay for music lessons for me um, and keep a roof over our heads um, so that we would have a promising future. So I was 18 years old when I lost him, and I thought I knew everything. You know, at that age, you do know everything. But I did learn to cherish every minute to cherish those memories, 
think back to your dad or that person that you're thinking about. The composer of this next song, uh, Ruth Elan Shreem, gives us a song about, well, it's a tender tribute to those memories. And most of all, when you do think of them and those tender memories, it's very important to thank the God where they came from, whether you've had that father figure for a month in your life or 80 years in your life. Um, it's just wonderful to think of those things. But when you do, remember to thank the Lord. Friends, it's been a great morning, beautiful music, great sermon from Danny. I hope that uh, in the challenge that you go, you know what, I'm all about this. I want to give from my life. I want to encounter the diversity. I want to experience all of God's good creatures and creation. And part of the way that we do that is through our generosity, it's through our giving. We can't receive from other people until we get into some space with them where we're giving. So this is an opportunity to begin doing that this morning. Ushers, please come.
thankful for my own dad today, Steve Spurlock. He, uh, as, as I was listening to stories this morning, I was thinking about all the many sacrifices he made for me to be where I'm at today. And in so much of me being here is due to him and his influence on my life. So I wanted to lift up his name today. I hope that you all can offer up the God names as we all stand this morning, as we sing out the doxology. Please bow with me. God of all creation and all the glorious creatures, made in all their rich diversity, you are the one who makes us whole and yet also makes us all so different. From the beginning of creation, you called out light from darkness, day from night, space from earth, sky from water, land. Plants, animals, human beings. And so, God, we lift you up. We lift up this deep, deep richness, layers, multispectral pieces of who you are, of who we are. God, give us a deep, deep appreciation and a good eye for seeing the beauty of it all, of sitting down at a table and what feels like awkwardness of not knowing really comes down to our own, own deep sense of arrogance that we have to be in control and have to be in charge and have to have safety. But in reality, we're looking at another creature that you love. And they're looking at us who you love. God, allow us, allow us to sit in the space, in the spaces of people who we disagree with and in the spaces of people who think very differently and believe very differently than us and allow us to try to embody them. And in so doing, discover why you love them so much and maybe in the process discover why you love us so much as well. God, in our world divided by war and hatred and prejudice, be our strong Father, whose will and way and forgiveness and daily bread and overcoming of evil is something that we not only experience, but that we cherish. And we lift up that prayer you taught us so long ago with these words, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing.
a simple way that we can celebrate diversity is these name tags. You all may think that they're a little bit silly, but the purpose of them is to get conversation going about the different things in your life or different opinions on different matters of the questions that we present you week to week. And I want you to remember to trade your name tag as you go out today and intentionally pray for the person you change, switch the name tag with all week long. I'll switch you right here, Elaine. And celebrate diversity. As you go out beyond those doors today, you're going to see people who look differently than you. You're going to try and speak to people who speak differently than you, that celebrate differently than you, that act differently than you. Lean into that space knowing God is with you and among you. And may God bless you and keep you, shape you and mold you, love you and hold you today and all of your days. Amen.